Well, good morning. It is so good to see you all today. Glad, glad you made it. Glad you're here. Welcome, welcome. As we go on to our second lesson in our study on 1 Peter, which wraps up chapter 1 and kind of just, just dips our toe into chapter 2. Uh, so let me pray for us, and then we will kind of unpack what we went through this week in our lesson. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for bringing us here together. We're excited to study and learn this morning. Holy Spirit, would you guide us in this lesson? Would you guide us through the scriptures? Help them uh, become more clear to us so that we can understand them better and then better understand how we are to live in this world. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. This week starts with a big key word that we need to pay attention to when we study the Bible, when we read anything in general, actually, and that is the word, therefore. Some of your translations might say, so, right? My, my, the translation I'm teaching out of this morning says, therefore, so that's what I'm going to run with. But most of you have heard this. I'm sure we need to pay attention when we see the word, therefore, because it's there for a reason. <laughs> it is. It's indicating, it's indicating something that has happened before that we need to be aware of. So in verse 13 starts, therefore, is it, it's indicating a couple things. One, it's indicating a movement in thought. We're now moving on to the next thing. But it's also indicating that the thing we are moving into is necessarily and irrevocably linked to what has just come before. We don't get to verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 1 without verses 1 through 12. Does that make sense? We, we don't get the, the hope and the ideas and the instruction that we get in the second half of chapter 1 without what has come before. So let's very quickly summarize what happened in Last week's lesson, remember with me, Peter, or the author of the book, whoever it is, is writing to the, their audience and saying, look, I know you're going through trials. I know you're in exile. I know you're a minority. I know you're on the outskirts. I know that nothing is going your way. I know you're suffering. But even in the midst of that, you can have hope. You can have peace. You can have all of these things. And remember with me for, for several reasons. One we get this early on in verse 2, because of the work of the sanctifying work through the Spirit to be obedient to Christ. That's thing number one. Thing number two is that you have new birth into a living hope. Not a dead hope, not a hope that you're waiting for, something that is here and now. You can be hopeful in the face of these afflictions. You can be hopeful in your exile, uh, you know, audience of, of 1 Peter. You can be hopeful in your trials. You can even be hopeful in your suffering, which is not the way of the world. The way of the world says there is no hope in that. But the author of 1 Peter comes in and says, because of the sanctifying work of the Spirit, because of you've been sprinkled with Christ's blood and purified, because of the resurrection it's through the resurrection of Jesus that you now have this new hope. You've been birthed into this new hope. And then furthermore, uh, beyond that, you also have come into an inheritance that does not perish, spoil, or fade. So there is hope. There is a background. There's a backstory. There's a prequel <laughs> to when we get to verse 13. It is because of all of these things Therefore, we come to today's passage which says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's works impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through, there's another through, through him you believe in God 
who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, there's another one. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. We get two therefores. I'm going to try to break down a little bit of the teaching between those therefores so that, so that we understand what's actually happening. The first therefore in verse 13, like we said at the top, is predicated, is, is, depends on everything that happens in verses 1 through 12. Again, you've been saved from something into something. You've been through the work of the Spirit into obedience to Christ, imperishable inheritance, all those things, right? Therefore, because that is the foundation Here is how you are to conduct yourselves. That's what the turn is in verse 13. Therefore, here's how you are to inhabit the world in which you are exiles, in which you are the strangers, in which you are the marginalized and those in the outskirts. You are to have uh, minds that are fully sober and you're to set your hope on the grace that's going to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. So even in verse 13, the hope and and, and the grace that they have and the expectation that you are to be self-controlled or fully sober, it's so that it's for the reality that Jesus is coming again. You don't get to just kind of like act however you want while you wait it out. The way in which they are called to endure, the way in which they are called to suffer, the way in which they are called to inhabit the world they live in is with minds that are alert and fully sober or fully self-controlled, which is a tall order in this world. (laughs) That is a tall order in the world in which we live. To remain alert and to be fully sober or or fully self-controlled. The temptation to lose self-control meets us at almost every turn. The temptation to, to kind of like numb ourselves and to not remain alert and to, and to be uh, kind of just quieted or to be uh, kind of just put our blinders on is at every turn because it's easier. <laughs> it's easier to go through life with dulled senses. This is why so many people are addicts to anything, to alcohol, to drugs, to our cell phones to a busy schedule, to moving from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, it's because it is easier to go through this life more often than not with dulled senses. It's not easy to stay alert. It's not easy to stay aware of everything because it is so bad sometimes and it is hard. But the author of 1 Peter says, no, because you have this inheritance, because you have this hope, because you have been born through the Spirit into the sanctifying work of the Spirit, into a new life with Christ, you are able to then be alert and fully self-controlled or fully sober. And you must be. <laughs> this, is, this is not um, a suggestion It is because of the reality of what Christ has done, of the fact that the Spirit indwells you, of the fact that God's plan from of old has always been this, that you can stand up even in the face of all these things that are happening. Verse 14 says, as obedient children. Again, this is is not request language. (laughs) This is not suggestion language. This This is how it's going to be language. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, before you knew Christ, before he was revealed to you. Don't go back to that. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it's written, be holy, 
because I am holy, which is a quotation from Leviticus. The people of God consistently throughout time have been called to be different and to be set apart. That's what holy means. Holy means to be set apart for a, for a purpose. It doesn't just mean, oh, we put you up on a shelf and you look real pretty and you, that's it. To be holy is to be set apart for a purpose with intention. What is, what is the intention? It's so that they can live appropriately in the world as God's. They are God's possession. They have been, they have been sealed with, with the promise of God. They've been sealed with the spirit. They are now belong to him and therefore something is demanded of them. We don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about the reality that like when the, the gift of, of faith, the gift of grace in our lives, which is 100% a gift, we do not earn it on our own, but that with that gift of, of grace comes like, there are strings attached to that. <laughs> Obedience is one of them. Being conformed to the image of Jesus is another. We don't just get God's grace and then sit back and say, oh, that felt great. I'm good to go now. Nothing is expected of me ever. That is nowhere in the Bible. When we get to James in just a few weeks, James is going to say faith without works is dead. It does not exist. It is null and void. It has no power. So the author of 1 Peter even is picking up on that idea and, and saying it in their own way of, of saying, you and I are called to be holy. We're called to be set apart for a purpose. The purpose is we now inhabit this broken world as Christians <laughs> in Christ through the power of the Spirit because we have an inheritance that does not perish, spoil, or fade. Because we've been brought into this new birth, this new hope through Christ. The therefore, at the start of verse 13, is powerful because what it indicates is that the demands that happen in the rest of that, that chapter are not just you trying harder. It's not just me like trying and being like, oh, if I could just pray a little bit more, if I could just like really knuck, like, just knuckle down and like do this, then somehow something would happen spiritual in my life. No, it's because the work of God has already begun in you that you and I are then called to live this way. God can demand that we be holy one, because he's holy, but two, because he's made it possible for us to be so. This is not like a ridiculous demand. This is not something outside of how it's supposed to be. We've been sanctified through the work of the Spirit to be obedient to Christ, which calls for holiness. It calls for alertness. It calls for us to be self-controlled or sober-minded, even in the face of this world. Verse 17 says this, Since you call on a father who judges each person's works impartially, Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. There again is this idea of because of God's grace that is a gift to you, you've done nothing to deserve it on your own. It's a gift, but it calls things forth from you. It calls things out of you. It demands your allegiance. It demands obedience. That's just how it works. <laughs> And so the author says that you are to live out your time in reverent fear. That doesn't mean we're like cowering in the corner from God. It means a reverent, holy respect the fact, for the fact that God is other. God is distinct. God is holy. God is different than we are. And so there's, there's an attitude change that comes with that. Verse 18, for you know it's not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. And here's a key, a turn that happens in 1 Peter. What are we redeemed from? The empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. The empty way of life that ultimately, when we zoom out and read the whole Bible, leads to death. The empty way of life that's ruled by sin, and that's ruled by the powers of this world, and that's ruled by things that are not God, consistently, always, always, 100% of the time, leads to death. And the author of 1 Peter is saying, you, you've been redeemed, you've been saved from that way of life, but the good news is, the thing that saved you is not perishable. <laughs> it's not going to fade. It's not going to one day expire, and you're going to be forced to go back into that way of life. No, it's eternal. What were they redeemed with? By the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Now, we need to pause right here. Some of you know this because we met last night to talk about it. <laughs> uh, some of you are in a class with me right now talking about um, the sacrificial system in the Old Testament and how that relates to Jesus' death and resurrection and the atonement. What Peter is saying here in verse 19, and this is key, 
He's not saying, this, this is not a reference to any type of idea of Jesus dying in your place. This is a reference more than likely to Passover, where a lamb without blemish or defect was killed and slaughtered and then eaten. The Passover lamb is not a sacrifice. It's a feast. In the Old Testament, the way you tell the difference is uh, if the people eat of, the, eat of what is killed, uh, it's not an atoning sacrifice. It's a feast. It's a celebration. Passover is not a sacrifice. It's a feast. So the author of 1 Peter is invoking here, as they do elsewhere through Old Testament references, more than likely the idea of the exodus. The idea of God saving his people from powers and systems that they could not save themselves from and bringing them into a new way of life, which is exactly what God did with the people in Israel and is exactly what God is doing with us even today. He is rescuing us from, what what does he say here? The empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors that always, always, always leads to death. (laughs) And and Jesus, through what he did, and and, and what Peter is saying here is, Jesus Christ, the great Passover lamb, the one who made it possible for us to be saved from exile, the one who made it possible for us to join in this story of God rescuing his people and putting us in a new place for a purpose, that's what we're joined to. That's the narrative that keeps moving on. That's what's happening here. Verse 20 even kind of just raises the ante even further and says, he was chosen before the creation of the world. Jesus' coming, the, the first advent, Jesus' birth, is not plan B. Jesus' life of holiness before God and amidst the people, Jesus' death and ultimately resurrection, are not plan B. This has always been the plan. We're told here and elsewhere, this idea that Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world. Which again should remind us, one, that again, this has always been the plan. Jesus isn't some backup plan. Two, Jesus is eternal. He's not just a good guy. He is God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have eternally existed. Triune God, the Trinity, has eternally existed. And this has always been the plan. This this way of working things out, this way of God revealing himself to us ultimately through Jesus has always been the plan from before the creation of the world. We are swept up and caught up in a story that is so much bigger than us. Praise God. (laughs) Because sometimes my story leaves a lot to be desired. Sometimes I don't know how to write the next chapter of my story. Sometimes I don't know how to make sense of what happened before. But what I do know is that my life and my kind of like sub story are caught up in the grand narrative of what God has always been doing. And here's one of our great hopes is that God has always had a plan. God has always been in the business of rescuing people out of situations and out from under things that they could not rescue themselves from on their own. We've been... We've experienced this rescue through our great Passover lamb, Jesus. Again, not in a Jesus died in our place way, but in this great celebration that's celebrating the idea of release from exile, release from slavery to sin and death. Again, verse 21, we get another through. I told you in the first section to pay attention to the throughs and intos, right? Verse 21 says, Through him, through Jesus, through our great Passover lamb who has rescued us from systems of sin that lead to death. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. They're not in yourself. They're not in your circumstances. They're not, fortunately, uh, in in the sense that, in the case that you're in exile, they're not in what's going to happen to you. Your faith and hope are not in, can I make it to the next day? My faith and hope are not in, do I have enough in the bank? They're not in, can I get this job? Can I make this happen? Can I do this? Can I do that? They are in God. Which again, if we kind of remember for a second, the original audience of this letter seems to be people who were experiencing trials and suffering and exile to be told and to be reminded, hey, 
Your faith and hope are in God, and that hope is secure. It doesn't go away. It doesn't spoil or fade or perish. None of that. It is secure. Like the comfort that that brings, the comfort that that brings us even today who aren't necessarily in exile. Like the peace that that kind of brings that just rests on us, that our hope is in God. Our faith is in God. It's not in my ability to conjure up something that makes sense of things. It's not in my ability to to get to the next step in life. It's not in my ability to, to do X, Y, or Z. It's not in my performance. It's not in can I get my life together enough so that somehow I'll be worthy. My faith and hope, your faith and hope if you are a Christian, are in God which just releases us from so much. That's good news. Like it just releases you. You can let some of the tension in your shoulders drop a little bit, right? We can kind of like the clenched fists or for me like the clenched jaw that I have to like wear a night guard for. Uh, I can release that a little bit. Just, it's in God. It's not in me. It's not in other people. It's not in institutions. My faith and hope are in God. And then he says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for each other, remember this section is is moving us from, here's the reality in which you live. It's not great, but there's hope. There's an inheritance. There's a new birth. There's a way of life in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now, 13 through the end of chapter 1 is, so this is how you live. He kind of comes to the crux of the matter and says, uh, now that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. He's talking about loving your fellow Christians here. This is, this is a, a singular community in this sense. Are we called to love those outside of the Christian faith? Absolutely. We're even called to love our enemies. But right here he's saying, you are called to love your fellow believers with a sincere love from the heart. And here's the reality. I had a friend one time say, love each other. We don't even like each other most times. In here, in the church, in our homes, in our small groups, in our Bible studies, whatever. Like there's always people that you're like, I don't really like her so much. I don't really like him so much. Like is not the bar. (laughs) Love is. Love is the bar. And if we cannot love each other in this place, How on earth do we hope to love those outside of this place? Love each other deeply with a sincere love from the heart. Not a fake love, not a love that goes, "Mm, that's so great for you. And then we turn around like at lunch we're going to like say some things, right? No. A sincere love from the heart. And let me tell you, if you have a prayer list, um, you should just add this to your prayer list. (laughs) Lord, would you help me love people, my fellow Christians even, with a sincere, pure love from the heart? Because here's the reality, and this is both good and bad news, that's not your and my natural disposition. (laughs) My natural disposition is to kind of like create a group of people that I like, and those are the people I love, and the people outside of that, I, nah, okay, you're okay, but you're not like one of these people, right? Even within the church, And let me tell you, when you're on a church staff, this is hard sometimes. I don't do a good job of this sometimes. Even within the walls of the building where we say we worship the same God and believe almost almost the same things most of the time, we differ on a few things, which is fine. We are called to love each other. And this love, this call to love, this demand to love, God can make demands of us, and he does is not just out of the blue, figure it out, make it happen. If you look at the verses that have preceded this, all of the 21 verses that precede where where the author of 1 Peter introduces this idea, it is prepping us, it is moving us towards this goal because of what God has done for you. Because you have been born into an imperishable um, uh, inheritance. Because you have experienced this new birth in Christ. Because the Spirit is in you. Because you're called to be holy. So then... 
the natural outworking of that is love each other with sincerity. This is not just a random demand that God is making. This is not just out of left field. This is grounded in the reality of God's very nature, of God's very character, of God's very self-revelation to these people. This is what happens when we understand properly what God has done and who God is and what our lives look like when they're swept up in that story. The natural outflowing of that is to love each other. And he says, for you have been born again. Again, he's giving us reasons for this. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed. Again, this idea of it's, it's, not, um, it's not something that's empty. It's not something that's going to fade. You've been born through imperishable seed through, there's another through, through the living and enduring word of God. Your hope and the thing that you've been moved into out of exile, again, this imagery of Passover, this idea that you've been moved from slavery to sin and death into this living and enduring word of God and to this new hope because of what God has done. And then he says this about the word of God. He says, and he quotes um, from Isaiah, he says, all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Your hope is in God. <laughs> it does not perish, spoil, or fade. The thing in which, as a Christian, we put our hope and we put our weight down does not fade. It doesn't crumble under the pressure of that. It doesn't crumble under our questions. It doesn't crumble under our criticism. It doesn't crumble when life falls apart and we go to God and we are a wreck. It does not perish, spoil, or fade. It is secure. It endures. The word of the Lord endures forever. You can sit back with the entire weight of your being, of your soul, of your pain, of your joy. You can sit back on the reality of the foundation that God is the one who knows what's happening and who is in control and who has made it possible for you to participate in life with him. That leads to an imperishable hope. And then we get the second therefore. Again, because of all of this, the author of 1 Peter has been building their case. Therefore, 2 verse 1, here's how you are to conduct yourselves. Rid yourselves, be done with all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Notice, these are all outward-facing things that affect other people. We talked about this in our leader group this morning a little bit. None of these are really things that, that harm you. They do in the sense that like you're holding up like just these sinful thoughts. But these are all outward facing things. I'm deceiving someone else. I'm committing um, hypocrisy in my life that affects other people. I'm envying something. I'm slandering other people. This again, love one another. <laughs> Love one another. Get rid of all the behavior of all the attitudes that plague you and that affect how you interact with other people. For, for the worse. Get rid of them. And instead, verse 2, like newborn babies, you are to crave, long for, uh, spiritual, pure spiritual milk so that, again, there's never just like a, this is what you should do. It's for a purpose. So that you may grow up in your salvation. You may mature. You may become more well-grounded in these realities. You can become even more knowledgeable in the things of God, which produces even more hope, which then produces even more love. It's like this cyclical thing. Us growing up in faith, us tasting of pure spiritual milk, which Paul then will talk about in other letters of saying, um, FYI, you don't get to hang out there too long. You need to move on to actually like some solids. We need to maybe introduce some avocado, maybe a banana. Right? Only peanut butter in a controlled environment these days, right? For my generation, they just slathered us in this stuff and they're like, figure it out. Uh, but yeah, we need to kind of introduce, but, but long for this pure, this, this spiritual food that will then help you grow up in your salvation. We don't stagnate, we don't stall out, we don't arrive. <laughs> I don't care if you're 8 or 98, you don't arrive in the Christian life. We don't just be like, well, I've read the Bible, you know, cover to cover like 10 times and I've been to Bible study my whole life and I pretty much have it figured out and I can just, I can just sit back and relax. 
No, continue to grow up in Christ. Continue to grow up in your salvation. Why? Again, we get another why. Verse 3, because you have tasted that the Lord is good. You can put your weight down on him. Literally, metaphorically, like you can sit down on the promises of God. You can sit down in God's character. You can sit down in the reality that you and I as Christians, if we've declared allegiance to Jesus, have been bought with something that is imperishable. It doesn't spoil or fade. We've been given this new birth into this new hope that then enables us to leave the former things. It enables us to remain aware, to remain alert. It enables us to have self-control, to be sober. It enables us to then love each other. The first Peter chapter one, especially, and even into chapter two, is all connected. And we're never given a do this without an explanation. It's always because God has done something for you. Or because as a Christian, this is what is expected or demanded of you because you've received the free gift of God's grace. We're never left on our own. We're never left to say, just figure it out. God says, here's, here's how we do this. And it's because we have tasted that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for coming alongside us as we, through the power of your spirit, grow in the things of you, as we grow in holiness, as we grow in love for each other, as we grow in desiring the things that you want, as we leave behind the, the things of this world or the, the ways of this world, the systems that operate this world. Holy Spirit, would you continue to help us do that? We cannot do it on our own.